Jumbo, welcome, Karibuni, to the Accountability on African SRHR Instruments online course. This course is brought to you by Accountability International, the AIDS Foundation South Africa, and the Sex Rights Africa Network. Today, we'll be focusing on people. Our learning goals are to understand the four most important groups needing SRHR. We want to be able to define each of the four groups. We also want to have a rudimentary understanding of the challenges being faced by each of these groups. Our learning times is 30 minutes. So let's start. Many people experience worst health than they would otherwise purely because of where they are born or because of their age, race, religion, or because of other underlying health issues. Others experience health issues because their behavior is randomly criminalized in some societies in this century. For example, women who are criminalized because they have sex outside of marriage, or people who are criminalized because they use drugs, or young girls who are criminalized because they are pregnant after being forced to marry, but they are still under age of consent. The legal context of each and every country is important in understanding the rights of individuals. Often these rights, which are protected under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, are infringed upon by national laws that demonstrate local conservative views. In some colonies, Legal pluralism exists, where parallel or traditional laws also exist in parallel to colonial legal systems. These customary or traditional laws may be more or less prohibitory and oppressive than the colonial laws, but seldom do countries meet or exceed the universal standards required, but they should constantly strive to do so. As a result of these shortcomings, many people suffer worse health outcomes than they would otherwise, and with regards to HIV and sexual and reproductive health even more so. In many places, Representatives of these communities are not included in decision-making spaces because of the stigma and discrimination they face. This exclusion and marginalization makes it even more difficult for these groups to get the services they deserve and need. Read on then to learn more about the different groups you are referring who are commonly affected by restrictions to adequate health care and human rights generally. The UNAIDS GAP report of 2014 succinctly underlines the way that AIDS does not exist in isolation, nor does it only relate to health. Treating AIDS as an isolated issue brings only partial benefits. Some populations do not have access because they are marginalized. Others because of harmful gender norms, poverty, legal and social inequalities. Where services are available, such as HIV services, uptake is dependent on the quality of services, as well as the levels of stigma and discrimination by service providers. In some instances, marginalized populations face complex life challenges, risks and obstacles on multiple fronts. But these are often taboo within a society, which collectively looks the other way. The GAP report identifies 12 groups of people that have been left behind in the HIV response, why they have been neglected until now, and what needs to be done to address the challenges to bring them the required access. These 12 groups are adolescent girls and young women, children and pregnant women living with HIV, displaced persons, gay men and other men who have sex with men, migrants, people aged 50 years and older, people living with HIV, people who inject drugs, people with disabilities, prisoners, sex workers, and transgender people. We'll now be focusing on each of the 12 groups, starting with youth. Africa's commitment to youth development and welfare was amply manifested in 2006 with the adoption by African heads of state and government of the African Youth Charter. The Charter provides a framework for developing and implementing more tangible youth policies and programs. This State of the African Youth Report was prepared as one of the key documents to inform African leadership at the 2001 Summit on the status of youth in the continent and to facilitate debate on plans for subsequent actions for further developing the continent's youth. Although some progress has been made, the number of maternal death is still high. Evidence shows that for, every, for very young adolescents in low- and middle-income countries, the risk of maternal deaths and obstetric fistula is twice as high than women who are older. Young people also have the highest rates of sexually transmitted diseases as well. Despite the increased need of, for SRHR, youth-friendly services remain often in pilot form in Africa, and are always dependent on the support of non-governmental development partners. These services have not been consistently scaled up by the public sector, and there is a dire need for this to be prioritized. 
There is a huge unmet need for contraception among young people, which is directly related to maternal mortality. Evidence shows that more than 60% of adolescents in sub-Saharan Africa who wish to avoid unwanted pregnancy do not have access to modern contraception. And safe abortion contributes significantly to maternal mortality among young girls, with an estimated 36,000 women and girls dying each year as a result of this. Knowledge about HIV is still one of the key challenges among young people. There is a high need in comprehensive knowledge of HIV. This lack of knowledge corresponds with low levels of condom use, although we have to say slowly some progress has been made. Child marriage continues to remain a huge problem across the continent. Africa accounts for 17% of 700 million women alive currently that were married before their 18th birthday. Child marriage affects girls' and women's quality of life at social and economic level, as well as their health not being able to fully realize their sexual and reproductive health and rights. Regionally, African Union member states have agreed to end child marriage through several policy instruments. Moving on to women and girls. The easy answer for why we should focus on women and girls is because a gap exists between the opportunities and resources available to men and boys and those available to women. According to the USAID quote, one in three girls around the world will experience gender-based violence in their lifetime. One in five in the developing world who enroll in primary school never finish, and one in seven in the developing world are forced into marriage before their 15th birthday, end of quote. Many countries have fallen behind on delivering on the sustainable development goals as they did with the Millennium Development Goals, despite some successes in some countries. The Swedish Ministry of Health identifies, quote, important causes are the growing population, continuing high fertility rates, poor sanitation and hygiene, malnourishment, a lack of gender equality, violence against women and children, high levels of HIV, poor capacity in health and medical care, and violence and conflict. Another important cause of ill health among children and mothers is the difficulty to reach the most vulnerable population groups. Although young people make up a large proportion of the population, their social, economic, political status is low, and they have limited influence in society, end of quote. Women and girls require enabling environments, by which we mean empowering policy, programming and implementation that enables them to have complete control over their bodies. When it comes to sex, sexuality and reproduction, many gaps exist in policy, programming and implementation and result in women and girls' lack of universal rights, access to comprehensive and quality SRHR, including who they love, who they have sex with, whether they become parents, etc. For the period between 2010 and 2015, the fertility rate in Africa stood at an average of 4.7 children per woman, which is above the replacement fertility rate of 2. Point children per woman. In 2013, 1.5 million new HIV infections occurred in sub-Saharan Africa alone. Furthermore, UNAs estimate that in sub-Saharan Africa, adolescent girls and young women make up for one in four of all new HIV infections. Lastly, the continent continues to have maternal mortality rates that remain extremely high despite several advances since the 1990s. While still on women and focusing on the image on our right, some sample statistics that affect African women and girls are 59% of Malawian women use a contraceptive method as compared to only 61.3% of Ugandan women and 20% of Liberian women. As in the case of Africa, a majority of violence against women remains high, as can be seen from the following percentages. In Burkina Faso, it's 19.8. In Cameroon, 54.6. In Egypt, 47.4. In Liberia, 44. In Kenya, 38.5. In Sierra Leone, in 55.5. In Zambia, 53.2 and Zimbabwe, 29.9. Most countries in Africa have between 41 and 60% of women having at least four antenatal care visits. In Cameroon, that's 58.1. In Guinea, 45.6. In Mauritania, 48.4. And Tanzania, 56.1. Lastly, the following countries, Burundi, Central African Republic, Madagascar, Mali, Morocco, Senegal, and Uganda, have between 20 to 40% of women attending at least four antenatal care during their pregnancy. We now move to migrants, refugees, and internally displaced populations. 
Migrants, refugees and internally displaced people all suffer multiple barriers to accessing their HIV, health and human rights. These barriers can be as simple as not having documentation to support their accessing a health clinic, to being illegal in a country, and that the risk of not only xenophobia, but also exploitation and trafficking. Lack of access to HIV programming that caters to this group specifically results in their vulnerability to contracting HIV, not accessing testing, treatment, care and support, nor being able to prevent further transmission. Added to this is the complexity posed by language and the continued treatment whilst on the move. Intimate partners of migrants are also at higher risk of various negative HIV and SRHR health outcomes. Mandatory testing for HIV in some countries adversely affects migrants as they move across borders, and for refugees, this is also problematic. Shockingly in Europe, only Portugal and the United Kingdom provide ARV no matter person's migrant status. The GAP report states, quote, there are approximately 231.5 million international migrants. End of quote. We now focus on people living with HIV. In 2019, there are 36 million people living with HIV, yet the HIV, health and human rights needs are being systematically neglected. Many people who are HIV positive still do not have access to ART, despite considerable gains in recent years. One of the most significant barriers to people with HIV seeking and securing healthcare and other basic rights is the criminalization of HIV transmission or non-disclosure or of other aspects of being, such as being gay, transgender, being a drug user, or a sex worker. The lack of freedom around bodily autonomy and the legal constraints on individuals results in them not being able to be transparent with their healthcare workers, which in turn affects health outcomes. Similarly, young people living with HIV who are not able to access contraceptives and barrier methods or ARVs can be at risk of unwanted pregnancies, STIs, and transmitting HIV. The latest data on new infections by a region from UNAIDS 2019 estimates on new infections as follows. Moving on to people who inject or use drugs. The GAP report states, and I quote, there are an estimated 12.7 million people who inject drugs, and 13% of them are living with HIV. On average, only 90 needles are available per person per year who inject drugs, while the need is about 200 per year and that people who inject drugs are 28 times more likely to have HIV than the general population, end of quote. In countries where opioid substitution therapy is not provided, we clearly see both higher HIV infection rates among injecting drug users, as well as higher criminal rates and rates of incarceration of injecting drug users. Drug users are too frequently cornered. Drug users are too frequently concerned Drug users are too frequently concerned, not about criminalization either, because the drug they use is illegal, or because of the lifestyle required to access the drugs. Incarceration, whether detention or imprisonment, places drug users and HIV-positive people at a greater risk of lack of adherence to both HIV and co-infection medications, for example, tuberculosis. The weak referral systems in in most countries and weak intake system leave HIV-positive people at a serious health disadvantage. Anne Fodham, the executive director of the International Drug Policy Consortium, recently wrote, we quote, The latest UN World Drug Report estimated that the number of drug use-related deaths soared to 585,000 in 2017 alone. The terrible truth is that most of these deaths could have been prevented if harm reduction and other health services had been available to those in need. The death toll from punitive approaches rises dramatically if extrajudicial killings, other unlawful killings and the use of the death penalty for drug offenders are added to this number, end of quote. What few are prepared to acknowledge is what Anne Fordham referred to as a white man's war on brown people's indigenous herbs, and that this war on drugs has catalyzed more suffering than good. Add to the criminalization of drug use, issues of sex work, being gay, being young or old, and various other factors, and we see the multiple layers of oppression and inequality that happen. We now move on to people living with disabilities and disability-identifying people. According to the World Report on Disability, there are around 785 to 975 million people living with disability, of which 2.2 to 3.8% experience significant difficulties in functioning. 
Where environments are not enabling, the quality of life outcomes can differ considerably for people with disabilities and their geographical location, nationality, socioeconomic status, legal status, age, religion, caste, ethnicity, gender, race, etc. can all place a significant role in whether the disability is a significant barrier to accessing HIV, health and other human rights. Children of sex workers, drug users, undocumented people and other criminalized groups can face further exclusions as a result of their parents' criminalization and thus have less chances of being enabled with the disabilities that can be mitigated with therapy. It is common knowledge that people who have mental disabilities are more likely to be targeted in assault and abuse, and as such are more vulnerable to violence of this sort. This stigma and discrimination, lack of awareness and general exclusion, all place disability-identifying people at greater risk of getting HIV and at lower chances of receiving adequate HIV prevention, testing, treatment, care and support, and health care generally. These barriers also obviously have similar consequences on employment, housing, education, social inclusion, and other opportunities. Moving on, disability-identified people, or those deemed by others to be impaired, often experience stigma and discrimination from able-bodied people and even each other. This, however, is a limited understanding of the advantages and disadvantages of the diverse ways in which the human body can exist and function. And critical disability studies are inter interrogating the wisdom and accuracies of such approaches. Creeping is the word that describes the taking, bad of, the taking back of the word cripple from being a negative to a positive aspect of one's life. It is complex, and readers should seek resources online to learn more. But one aspect is that people who are differently abled, mentally or physically, can actually experience some advantages over those who are not. For example, people with autism, quote, often have exceptional memories and can remember information they read weeks ago. They are also less likely to misremember something and often outperform others in auditory and visual tasks and also do better on unverbal tests of intelligence, end of quote. Honesty, punctuality, attention to detail have also been documented as traits that people with autism have in greater quantities than non-autistic people. What is however necessary is to understand that people who are differently abled, if not provided with an enabling environment, can be exposed to a human rights abuse and the stigma and discrimination they face can limit their access to education, healthcare, employment, housing, and even place them at the greater risk of physical, verbal, and sexual abuse and violence. It is vital for all people to remember that individuals with disabilities and disability identities have the right to exist, to make their own choices, and to be expected, included, and welcomed in all societal spheres. Individuals who are disability identified have ownership of their own bodies, minds, ideas, thoughts, and feelings. People who live with disability have the same sexual and reproductive health needs as other people. In 2006, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability was adopted. It aims to, quote, promote, protect, and ensure the full and equal enjoyment of all human rights and fundamental freedoms by all persons with disabilities and to promote respect to their inherent dignity, end of quote. Despite the fact that 160 states signed this convention and that disability is referenced in many parts of the SDGs, people with disabilities continue to face multiple challenges that limit or deny the access to human rights. It is thus important to be aware that disability is not just a health matter, but rather is a complex condition which affects the way people interact and make decisions. As well as, it is crucial to be aware that people with disabilities have the same human rights and the same needs of us all people. Moving on, we come to lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, intersex, queer, gender non-confirming, women who have sex with women, and men who have sex with men. In many parts of Africa, people who, people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender suffer immense stigma and discrimination. Gender and sexual norms exist, which are strictly controlled by patriarchal society. Sexuality is not always openly discussed, and religion and culture are being used as a tool to oppress LGBT Africans. In some communities, men are allowed to enjoy and express their sexuality, 
whereas women are taught that their sexuality is not to be expressed. These ideas around sexuality play out in society, which is detrimental to both heterosexual people and people who have same-sex desires. Fear has been the most potent and convincing weapon that patriarchal religious and cultural institutions, together with states, have used to make people believe that same-sex desires or other identities are abnormal and will threaten the very existence of African humanity. This has led to extreme stigma, in turn leading to discrimination to the point where some African states have sought to strengthen the already existing laws which criminalize homosexuality. It is within this climate that LGBT organization and progressive human rights organizations work to champion the human rights of all sexualities and gender diversity. LGBT rights are laid out in many national, regional and international laws, resolution and codes which speak to equality, non-discrimination, dignity, non-violence and protection of the law. The United Nations Declaration of Human Rights of 1948 sets out fundamental human rights to be universally protected, including the following, and promotes the teaching thereof to expand the understanding of, respect for, and realization of these human rights. In 2014, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights adopted the landmark Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Resolution 275 on protection against violence and other human rights violations against persons on the basis of their real or imputed sexual orientation or gender identity. The AIDS epidemic has opened up space to discuss sexuality more openly, particularly heterosexuality, and gradually started to speak about same-sex desire of men who have sex with other men, who may or may not identify as gay. This has been discussed from an epidemiological point only, and not really from a human rights or empowering position. There has been very little discussion and research done on HIV amongst lesbian women and other women who have sex with women and trans and intersex persons. In addition to the terms LGBTIQ, GNC, it is important to note that the terms MSM and WSW exist and are useful for including those people who do not identify as gay or lesbian but who still have same-sex sex. Identifying as gay is not a necessity for same-sex sex, as there are a large proportion of people who engage in sex with people of the same sex but do not identify as gay. Many people tend to think that MSM is synonymous with being gay, when in fact it is not. MSM and WSW are terms which come to the closest to describing sexual diversity and sexual desire. Discrimination and violence against LGBTQ Africans are all too common. This violence is mostly influenced by religious beliefs, cultural norms, and political bias. Trans-identifying people experience enormous amounts of violence. In the Southern Africa Trans Forum situation analysis from 2016, 53% of respondents reported experiencing physical violence in the past 12 months because of them being trans-diverse or gender non-conforming. Yet, only 24% reported it to authorities and 30 only 30% received the necessary medical care. In the same study, 34% of the respondents reported experiencing sexual violence, including attempted or completed rape, in the last 12 months. 16% of the respondents reported it to authorities, and a mere 19 received medical attention. 22% reported having experienced attempted or completed rape by an, an intimate partner, yet only 14% reported it to the authorities, and 17% received medical care. We now move on to prisoners and people who pass through places of detention. According to the UNAIDS GAP report, 30 million people spend time in prisons or closed setting every year, and 10 million people are incarcerated at any given point in time. A 2014 study found that nearly half of all black males and 41% of white males had been arrested by the age of 23 in the US. In the UK, these figures are 30 percent of all men. The reality is that almost all people who enter prisons and other places of detention, whether youth detention or adult, will be released back into their communities, usually within a few months or at least three years. Many international guidelines exist that instruct what living conditions are suitable for people who are placed in prisons. They include the International Guidelines on HIV and AIDS, the WHO Guidelines on HIV Infection and AIDS in Prison, the United Nations Rules for the Treatment of Women Prisoners and Non-Custodial Measures for Women Offenders, and the Mandela Rules 
which include extensive revisions and addition to the UN to the UN standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners. A 2014 report by Safes and Accountability International found that, quote, in each of the six countries examined, the basic necessities for are lacking for prisoners, either permanently or intermittently. This lack creates not only an unhealthy environment, but is a direct abuse of the prisoners' human rights. End of quote. The countries that were examined were Lesotho, Malawi, South Africa, Iswatini, formerly Swaziland, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. To quote, each of the six countries requires an overhaul of the national law as well as the judicial system and policy to improve the basic necessity of the enabling environment, but also as a means to improve disease control. Overall, the six countries remain with exceptionally high occupancy rates, as well, even though some of them can be seen to have attempted to lower them, such as Eswatini and Lesotho. South Africa and Eswatini have the highest percentage of people in prisons and have done so consistently over the period analyzed, end of quote. Finally, we now come to sex workers. Studies have shown that sex workers continue to face gross human rights violations and abuse to the, due to the criminal nature of their work. This more commonly involves unlawful arrests and detention, violence, extortion, as well as societal exclusion. In fact, in one study, it found out that Quote, majority of countries in the world have punitive laws against sex work, and virtually throughout Africa, this occupation is an explicit criminal offense, end of quote. Because of this criminalization, the impact on HIV and health access cannot be ignored. Historically, sex workers have borne societal brand as being carriers or reservoirs of diseases and are generally blamed for HIV crises. Whereas there are many reasons to engage in sex work, Poverty and unemployment are often largely cited as a driving force. But even despite this, sex work is also seen as providing financial independence and improves the economic circumstances of sex workers. While majority of sex workers are female, there is a sizable population of male and trans-identifying sex workers. Apart from societal stigma, male and trans sex workers face further discrimination on account of homophobia and transphobia. Access to justice for most sex workers is often hampered by police and local authorities. This is in addition to arbitrary raids, forced HIV and STI testings, and with attempts at proposed subsidiary laws to ban sex work. Underlying all this, however, are narratives of resilience and resistance. Sex work organizing in the continent is regional, with many countries now having national sex workers' movement, with Kenya and South Africa being the more visible one. Additionally, Local grassroots organizing, media campaign, street activism, and more funding for sex workers have supported and built the visibility of sex workers. We now come to the time to assess yourself. Can you name and describe three of the most important communities that require access to SRHR in Africa? Can you explain why each of the groups face challenges when accessing adequate SRHR? And finally, what do each of the groups have in common? Thank you very much. Should you wish to get in touch with us, please use the addresses above. Thank you. Asante.